Welcome to uh, the next uh, video from the PhD Toolbox organized by the ICDD. Uh, my name is Madeline Moore. I am currently a postdoc at the University of Bielefeld, but I completed my PhD at the ICDD in 2020. So today I'm going to be talking to you about document analysis, in particular coding and within coding, focusing specifically on thematic coding. So what we'll be talking about today I know that analysis and coding can take some time and it's really important though because it's the way that you start to tell a story about your research or really develop your argument. So up until now in your research process you might have a research question hopefully uh, and some broad theoretical perspectives that you're trying to intervene into. You also have gone out into the field, you've collected lots of documents um, and data, different forms, uh, that you will then be coming back to your office and trying to make sense of. So how do we make this data speak to your theoretical perspective as well as your research question? And how do we start to develop this argument that is both methodologically sound and also justifiable? So what I'm going to go through with you is these specific questions i.e. what can I analyse, what is thematic coding, what types of thematic coding exist, what is a code and what is its difference to a theme, uh, what are the steps of coding, and then talk you through how I did it, a really short example in my own PhD, and then a little kind of description of the functionalities of certain qualitative research uh, data software analysis tools before finishing with some final tips. So importantly, I'm going to be talking about qualitative research data analysis, not quantitative. So if you want quantitative, now is the time to turn this video off. <laughs> so what kind of documents can count as data? So in qualitative research, uh, what counts has shifted over time. And we're now at a period where most things can count. It just depends on your theory, your methods and how you go about using it. So, for example, this can include reports, media releases, social media posts and diaries. But be careful with social media posts and diaries in that they are still often considered a form of private data. And so things of ethical considerations really need to be taken into account. You can also use manuscripts, interview transcripts and so forth. So when I'm talking about data in this talk uh, or documents in general, I'm referring to all of these sorts. So now that we've got that established, what do we do with them? What do we do with this data and these documents? And this is where forms of coding become really important. I, we have a research question, we have these piles of data. How do we then go about telling this story? So the point of coding uh, really is to make sense of the data that we've gathered. I, we don't just accept the documents at face value, but we want to go beyond them we want to explore what they say, why they say this, what is the importance to what they're saying, and how does this then talk to our research questions. So through coding, we can really start to tell a story about this data, and we're looking for the patterns and the meaning making behind it. So there are really multiple, multiple, multiple ways to code, and I'm just going to cover a couple and two kind of diverse poles of this broad field. But how you want to code and for what reason will be really guided by your research questions and the method and the theories that you choose. So what I'm talking about here is that coding is not a theory in itself. It's a specific method that can be made to talk to multiple theoretical positions. For example, if you want to know how often Donald Trump uses the term fake media or fake news, this would be a form of content analysis that could be done by counting the number of times he uses the term in his speeches or documents. However, if you actually want to understand what fake news means, you would need to go beyond a frequency analysis and instead start to look for the patterns, i.e. who is he referring to, when does he use it, what other terms are used in relation to fake news. And this is what I mean by using coding as a way to uncover the patterns and the meaning making behind the documents themselves. We're also moving beyond a single document to try and get these documents to start talking to each other. So what will become clear uh, is that there's not just one way to code. And that means that you as a researcher 
really need to make some fundamental question, uh, decisions in your research process about why you're doing this uh, and justify those decisions that you're making. This can often be what scares students away from coding because there's often the fear, uh, underlying fear that, you know, have I coded this correctly? How do I know if I'm doing it right? And so forth. And the answer to these questions is really that, are you able to explain why you coded something the way you did? And can you document this in your methodology? So I'm gonna constantly refer to this kind of justify, justify, justify. And this is really one of the important points of why a research diary um, is a fundamental part of your research process when you're coding in qualitative research. So what do I mean by a research diary? A research diary can be either included in your data software tools, and I'll talk about that soon, or it can be a you know, traditional diary, uh, a notebook, where you document your coding decisions and you note and make memos to yourself about the research process. So it starts to show the layers of coding that are undertaken. And this diary becomes really important um, in your kind of methodology chapter in your PhD, but also you know, in your defense, uh, or if you're ever questioned by other people about your data, you can go back to your research diary and say, well, I made this decision because of this and it speaks to my theory and so forth. But the key point to remember at this point is coding is a method. It doesn't substitute for theory.